Our next guest has travelled to some of the most dangerous places on Earth, including Syria and northern Iraq, making it his mission to rescue women who've been tricked, trapped and enslaved by so-called Islamic State. So between 2016 and 2019, the ex-British army soldier led his small band of committed Kurdish freedom fighters through ISIS-held territory and in doing so rescued more than 100 women and children who were desperate to escape. John Kearney, which is not his real name for security reasons, joins us now to protect his identity. We're not going to be showing his face throughout the interview. Good morning to you, John. Thank you for joining morning us. Good to you. Thank you. Uh, so, look, let's start at the beginning. How on earth did this become a mission for you? What prompted you to try and save these women and children? It's a, more of a human interest. Um, when you have vulnerable uh, young ladies, young girls and children um, venture into these hostile areas, they need um, some help. They need somebody to... Um, come down to a level, a personal level, um, and understand why their uh, motivation, um, why they've arrived in these locations, etc. Um, so you can build up a framework and you can build up a, a huge picture of mm. why these people have gone from a certain city or a certain um, uh, poverty place and arrived in a hostile area. All over Europe, because they've got a lot of these yes. people. But you were working in these areas, weren't you? you, were, you were, were you doing private security? I've been, I've been involved in Iraq and Syria for well over a decade now. Um, have a good understanding of the, the region, um, the cultures. Um, and this was a basis of how this could be done. And was uh, it literally a cry for help from one young woman that started? Absolutely. Um, you're talking about vulnerable people here. Um, so young. Um, they, they, they don't really understand what they're getting involved in um, at, the, at the time they're led to believe to go away to Syria or Iraq. So you're in a situation where you're working as security out there and you get a call to say, please help me. And I imagine then, because you were successful, that word gets spread. What an extraordinary existence to be one person in one life and yet doing what was an incredibly brave thing to do, to go in uh, as a one-man band with a group of people, not backed by government, not backed by an organisation, and try and haul these young women out? I mean, you are totally independent. Um, not only are you looking out for um, checkpoints that could uh, initially drag you out of a vehicle and you could be led on the street yourself as a, as a, you know, a, a, a victim, but you're also looking out for... Um, uh, coalition forces mm. that could take you as a, a, an opportunist target as well. So you could be easily um, uh, taken out by... Did you fear kidnap? Did you fear some of the horrific retaliation that, that we've seen from from these groups? There's beheading? always a huge element of danger. Um, we've, we've all seen it in the media, what happens to people when they're called in the wrong location at the wrong time. Uh, you know, uh, it, it is pretty horrific torture uh, and death. This uh, fear, um, there is an element but with your planning and your, your abilities and, and what you can actually do on the ground yourself, you can maximise uh, mm. and really negate your risk assessments, etc. And, mm. and So why do it? Because we've had the case of Shemima Begum, haven't we? That, and she wanted and cried for help to come home. And people said, no, you know, you've made your bed. The government now said Now you have to lie it. The government said no, the Home Secretary said no. Um, and a lot of people in the country agreed. What... What did you see in some of these cries for help that the government, the Home Secretary, and a lot of the country didn't? Why do you not view them as terrorist supporters? Or, or a threat as well, because yeah. often the fear is that they'll come back, having been radicalised, they'll come back, they'll settle back mm. into our society, but then they become a threat when they come home. The method on, um, on how people are, are, are rescued or extracted is they are given to um, the correct authorities via local forces. So. I have no part in actually taking people back to the UK or taking people to... But a in your country. head, you resolved that you weren't increasing the threat to this country, I'm sure, Absolutely. and that you resolved you were doing the right yeah. thing. You know, what did you see that perhaps people that haven't been as close to it don't? So you, it goes back to the vulnerable um, young girl aspect. Uh, they have children. They have come from a, a background, um, be it bullied or be it... Um, they have no money, they have no life. Um, they've, they've been called upon or, or it goes back to the, the heartstrings. Maybe they have a husband or a boyfriend that's traveled away, so they follow in tow um, and they end up in this situation and they realize this situation isn't correct. Um, it's not how they envisaged or, or how they want to um, live their life. Um, and that's when the call for help goes. 
Uh, and, and basically, you set in motion the cogs, and like I said, it, it, the person is then extracted and given to local forces or uh, a consulate. And I think you've said uh, to us, you feel like everybody deserves a second chance. Mm. Absolutely. Uh, I think everyone, and, and don't forget, when that person goes back to their, their country and it's down, then down to the government or, or the authorities to then trial them. Yeah. So there is full closure. There's closure for a lot of people in that respect. You have a family, though, uh, John, back yep. here in the UK, of course. How do they feel about the fact that you're not only putting yourself in these extraordinarily dangerous situations, but undoubtedly bringing attention and danger to them as well? We... Um, we have certain mechanisms in place um, as, as a family. Uh, and this, this has been going on for a long time. I've, I've been working in hostile areas uh, and doing this type of work for many, many years. Um, so it's a kind of nine to five job for myself and, and who I work directly with. Um, so this area is covered um, security wise. You, um, we've obviously taken great care this morning to protect your to real identity for those reasons. Um, but. Is it safe to say that there is a price on your head in certain quarters? There is. I mean, when, when, you, when you go toe-to-toe -to -toe with these guys um, uh, and, and you cause ripples, obviously there's going to be some um, aspect of, of retaliation or, or some mm -hmm. um, opportunist person that would like to um, have, have a, a credible chance at um, having a go at you, basically. Stopping you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you've written this book, Operation Jihadi Bride, uh, which is your mission, your covert mission to rescue the women from ISIS. Um, I, I, I'd imagine that the, the, the lives that you've saved and the, and the children's lives that you've saved, they will be forever grateful of that. But mm. it must be sort of a, a constant battle for you because you can't save everybody. Um, these people get your phone number and they're, they're in the middle of a, a war zone and you could be shopping over here. Absolutely, and the expansion is, is not only stopping here. We're looking at we have, we have um, networks developing in Africa for um, uh, illegal um, transportation of girls to all locations of the world. So this is still ongoing now. Um, mm. we're, we're we're still working with. We're, we're led to believe that ISIS isn't a credible threat anymore. That, you know, Donald Trump famously stood up and said they've been defeated. Do you agree with that? Do you think they're still there? They're always going to be a threat. Any any group that splinters, any group that has um, assets, any group that has financial backing is is going to be a risk. Um, they're, they're, people are still losing their lives on a daily basis in the Middle East um, and throughout the world due to you know this organisation. So it is an ongoing threat, of course. It must be heartbreaking when you just can't help someone. It's um, yeah, you, you you can you can only do as much as you can of course, with of the course. limited resources you have. Well, it's very brave that you do what you do. Yeah, thank um, you for coming in, John. Fascinating to meet you. And, and, mm. and the book looks uh, gripping as well. You've written it with uh, Clifford Thurlow, mm. who, uh, and I just, um, I'm looking forward to reading more of that. Yep. Fantastic all back, sorry. Yeah, fantastic Thank you very much for coming in. Thank you.